there are many times here, well, every time, that you are going to get confronted by the Holy Spirit. Sadly enough, that confrontation is coming from my mouth. So you think it's me. You are thoroughly wrong. Sadly enough, you are thoroughly wrong. Some of you have taken it personally. How could he say that about me? Do you really think I have that ability to know what's going on in your life and that I can, and do you really think that I would use this time where thousands of people are watching to say something to you? You know me. I'm a former gang kid from the Bronx. If I got something to say to you, hear me. I will say it to you. I will not say it. I will not embarrass you. I will not shame you, but I will say it to you. Know that. Without a doubt. Okay? I'm not going to use the pulpit and the beamer as a weapon. I never did, and I never will. So if you're being convicted, you might want to check with the Lord. Okay? The Bible says many places. First Thessalonians, it says it in Hebrews. Many places it says, make it a joy for those who are teaching and confronting you. It says that in the Bible, so that you can change. Do you realize if you're not confronted, there's no way you can change? Why would you want to leave here the same way you came in? I don't want to leave here the same way I came in, and I won't, and I never do. Why would you? Listen, some of you have Bible studies. Some of you have, have things you put on the Internet. I just have to read this, okay? So, so everybody who's watching understands. At Beth Yeshua International, we are blessed to have a genuine and heartfelt sense of love, family, and community. We are told by many that they can feel God's love as soon as they drive on the property. So many people who have visited our humble little congregation have told us over and over again that the love for one another is blatant and pervasive. This is a huge compliment when you consider the fact that Yeshua himself said that people will know we belong to him by the way we love each other. Many people here at BYI also share the love of God's word and his ways with each other outside of BYI in very various forms. And this blesses us as well. We are so happy to see people sharing outside of BYI, but you must realize that these are not BYI-sanctioned ministries. Just because somebody drops my name on the internet or study does not mean I bless what they're saying. Okay? You have to understand that. And I don't have time to go to the bathroom, so I don't have time to read your study and give it the okay. We cannot, meaning the leadership at Beth Yeshua, cannot be responsible for what is being taught or shared. In other words, they may or may not reflect the opinions and or theology of the leadership of BYI. Therefore, we can't sanction it. It doesn't mean that what they're saying is not of God, but it doesn't mean that what they're saying is of God. Okay? You do, are we, do we understand what I'm trying to communicate? Okay. With that being said, only the ministries that are listed on our website are those that are sanctioned and led by approved BYI leadership. Amen? Amen. Amen. Okay. you you got to understand, if you're being convicted, I, I'll, give you, I'll give you an example, okay? I'm on my way to the airport one week ago today. Going to fly from Daytona to Knoxville, okay? I'm in a car, and I'm in an Uber car. I'm talking to the guy about the Lord, so i got nothing better to do, right? And I could see that he, he at one time had some kind of relationship with God. About 20 minutes in, I said to him, I said, listen, I think what you need to do is you need to stop driving this Uber car like like today. And you need to go to a technical school. You need to study welding, and you need to move to Dallas. He pulls over the car, starts crying, because he said, you're not going to believe this. I said, try me. (laughs) He said, I've been looking in this technical school to Jacksonville, and I was going to study welding, and I felt like I should move to Dallas. Now, do you think any human being has the ability to do that? And that's what I told him. I said, we're probably never going to see each other unless you attend the wedding feast. This is not about me. This is letting you know that a hack like me can be used of God like a, like a ventriloquist dummy. God's trying to talk to you, son. God's after you. He hasn't let you go. You know, he had a calling on your life when you were a little boy. That calling, you're not disqualified. No matter what you've done, you understand what's happening. So if today you should be a little convicted, get off it. 
Stop giving yourself that much credit that I'm going to use valuable time from God's throne to talk directly to you from this bema. Understand? Good. Let's move on. I thank God that my kids had a mother who gave them boundaries and looked after them. You should thank God for the leadership at Beth Yeshua, that they're willing, that they're willing to have people talk and murmur and do whatever they do for the sake of God's great glory. Our Torah Pasha today comes to us from Leviticus chapter 19. Um, let's hold off on that. Thank you. The chapter is basically a call to holiness. Here the Lord strongly commands the people, including the priests, okay? Including the priests to become holy in their practice. The chapter declares that holiness must be practiced in every sphere of one's life. Many of the rules that God puts forth are oriented towards the Israelites functioning as a loving community. Let me repeat that. As a loving community. It does not matter, pal, how much you know. It does not matter, but how well you can quote Scripture. It doesn't matter. You'll never know the Word of God like the devil does. And how is he doing? Trust me, I know the Word of God pretty well. I've read the Bible cover to cover many times. I read it every day. And still, I'm not impressed with my biblical knowledge or my theological knowledge. Neither is God. We have to function as a loving community and serving one another's well-being. You hear this? Not self-serving, not just serving God. He's fine. God's fine. Okay? There's, there's, there's some water by God, and it stays nice and smooth. You know why? The weather's beautiful in heaven. He's doing fine. You don't have to worry about him. You're here to serve one another. We're here to serve one another. And this is something, mind you, that I see just too little of these days. Now let's look at the Torah Pasha. Two verses, which speaks volumes. Adonai said to Moshe, okay, speaking directly, if you want to hear God's voice, read the book of Leviticus. There's no book like it in the whole Bible where it says, and God said, and God said, and God said. A couple hundred times, and God said, 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 and God said. Read the book of Leviticus. Not that boring, if you like God's voice. Adonai said to Moshe, quote, speak to the entire community of Israel. Tell them, you people, try that today, ought to be holy, because I, Adonai, your God, am holy. Okay? First thing I want you to see is it's the entire community. Everything that's said from this bima goes for everybody, including yours truly. Nobody gets a pass. I don't know where Stephen Seagal is in his walk with God or lack thereof, but he had it right when he said nobody's above the law. Now let's look at the word holy. 544 times or 45, depending on what version you read. That's a lot. That's a lot. The Bible's not big. It's a small book. One book. 544 times. Kadosh, which we sung about a lot today. The word is sacred, saintly, and set apart. Sacred, saintly, and set apart. So let's look at Leviticus 19, 1 and 2 again. You can look at it up there on the screens. The basis of all holiness, the basis of all holiness is found in these words, I, I don't know your God, am holy. So if you should ask, hey, Lord, why should I be holy? God would say, because I am. And what does that mean? Human holiness is the very imitation of God. If you want to imitate God, then you should try and be holy. In other words, we are called to become and act like God. Yeshua came and gave us an example. Prior to him coming on the scene, we really didn't have an example. He's the model son, and if we're sons and daughters of the Lord, we should model and pat pattern our life by Yeshua. It's really quite simple. Study his life, because we don't have much of it. You have his birth, you have a couple of hours when he was 12, and then you get three and a half years. It's not a lot of stuff. He didn't say that much. 
Rabbi, what are you saying? I'm, I'm saying he didn't say that much. Three of the Gospels are synoptic. We've got 1,200 sentences. That's not much. Surely you can study his life and then pattern your life by it, no? Isn't that the program? I don't know what Episcopalians do. Well, actually, I do. And I don't know what Baptists do. Actually, I do because I study, I study denominations. I want to know how they started. What are their principles? What's their philosophies? But the bottom line is we're not called to be denominational. We're called to be identical. We're called to be imitators. Okay? We have too many impersonators. We need imitators. Correct? Okay. The next verse, this is, this is chock full. This is, look at this one verse, 19.3. Every one of you, does that include... Yep. Yep. You don't have to be a rocket scientist or a scholar or a theologian. You know, or get on Twitter and break it down. Every one of you is to revere his father and mother, and you are to keep my Shabbats. I am Adonai, your God. In this one sentence, God covers the fifth and the fourth commandments of the Decalogue, the Ten. In one sentence, right away, he's talking about holiness, and he goes, hey, you want to be holy? Forget about, you know, laying prostrate or, or, or speaking in tongues or all that stuff. You want to show me a holy, God says? Act right towards your parents. And parents, stop being your kids' friends. Stop it. Stop thinking it's cool to have a drink with them and go shopping and wear the same clothes. Grow up. Grow up. They don't need a comedian. They need a father. They need a mother. That's the way God set it up. I'm telling you, my daughters, they never did anything wrong. I don't know why. They just didn't. My sons... (laughs) Okay, I don't know what that means, but we're going to disregard that comment. (laughs) Bailiff, take her out, strike it from the record. One more comment, I'm going to hold you in contempt of synagogue. (laughs) Anyway, let me move on. The boys were good, but all I have to do, to this day, just had it yesterday. All I have to do is just, Maxie, come here. And he knows. Maxie, come here. And he knows. Jeremy, 28 years old, when he came to visit for Passover. Jay, come here. That's it. And then they come, they know, they know what's coming next. They know, and they're like, oh, no. Wow. And I just go, who am I? You're my dad. Who, who am I? Tell me again. I'm not sure who I am. Who am I? You're my dad. Do we, you want to understand? Do we want to take this any further? No, dad. I get it. Okay. We're good. Love you, kid. That's all it takes. I'm their dad. I'm going to love them because I have, and we have sacrificed greatly. But boy, oh boy, I'm just not going to tell them that they got to obey the commandments. I want to see it. I want to see it. Now, let's look up this word, revere, because it's a, you know, it's not an easy word. It's not a common word. It's Hebrew, yare, and it means to fear or to be afraid. Don't make any mistake, New Wave Aftershave churchgoers. It means to be afraid. I know we just want to take Jesus to Starbucks and have a latte and sing songs. I know we want to frolic with the Father. Hey, Dad, want to go to a ball game? Want to go shopping at the Gap? That's not revere. That's not reverence. Mm -mm. Let me tell you, my dad was, loved my mom. I had a great example of somebody who loved my mom, and he loved his kids, but he was a tough guy. Toughest guy I ever met, by far. I met a lot of tough guys. Tough. 
it wasn't his teaching that kept me straight. You follow what I'm saying? It wasn't a sit down, son. Mm-mm. James Dobson would have had a real hard time with my dad. But when he died when I was 15, that's when all hell broke loose in my life. Because I wasn't, you know what I mean? I hung out across the street with all the drug dealers when I was 10 and 12, and I could remember him coming over to 41 Park in front of all these tough guys and gangbangers, and my dad coming there and grabbing me and saying, are you kidding me? And grabbing me and grab, pulling me home. Yeah, saying, no, that's not gonna, that's what, it's not going to work that way for you, kid. And I remember someone that would say something, my dad would be like, I'm telling you, I watched my dad one time. I could not believe it. Just, he was on a chair. He put the newspaper down, walked over, knocked the kid out, went back and read his paper like, <laughs> I never seen anything like it. Not even in a movie. Yeah, the good old days when you could knock a kid out. And the kid, when he came to, he begged you not to tell his parents because then he'd get knocked out again. I miss those days. I got to be honest with you. Time out. What a crock of crap. Knockout. I know there's somebody here for the first time going, this ain't my church. No, it's not, ma'am. No, it's not. This is the church of the real deal. No, we don't put on a little face, go, everything's fine. Everything is not fine. Okay, the world is falling apart, okay? Because there's two pillars in this world, and one is called authority, and one is called rebellion. And there's a lot of a rebellion in our society. We need submission, not rebellion. The Bible says if you do not submit... To what you do see, you can't submit to what you don't see. So don't tell me in your rebellious state that you're submitted to God. The Bible says that is a bold-faced lie. Now, let's look at this word revere regarding the Lord. Because it's different regarding the Lord and regarding your parents. Regarding the Lord, it means to stand in awe or to reverence. To literally tremble. Every time God showed up, didn't they tremble? Did, when Yeshua walked, didn't the demons tremble? What do you want with us? They were scared poopless. And we treat him like, oh, he's just, you know, he's just a guy. Just a cool guy. Just a neat guy. He's the son of God. He's the son of God. The only unique, begotten Son of God, the Messiah, the one that connected you with the Father. The one that said on the cross in excruciating pain, Father, please forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Please, Father. He's to be worshipped. Worshipped. Now, Yahweh regarding father and mother is a little different. It means to honor and respect. So with the Lord, it means to bow down and worship. But with mother and father, according to the Masoretic text in the original Hebrew, it means to respect with a slight degree of awe. A slight degree of awe. So they should see you as a shining star. If they don't, then you give them one in the head, and when they see stars, they'll... (laughs) Oh, now I get it. In Judaism, when we are called to the Bema, this is called the Bema, an uplifted platform where we read the Word of God from because the Word of God is respected and honored, we call the name of the reader as well as the reader's father. So, in the, for example, if I was being called when I was young and I was going to the Orthodox Temple, they would go, Yamod, Getzo Moshe, Ben Meavevel, Ha Levi, Ha Torah. So they would say, Getzel, Greg, Moses, Ben, Maya, Victor, of the tribe of Levi, come. Now, why are they calling my dad's name when it was just me coming to the Bema to read from the Torah? Because we are instructed to honor our parents. And our parents are instructed to teach the commandments of God to their children. Therefore, by the way we as children live our lives and choose to live our lives, 
shall either bring glory or shame to our parents' great name. It's not a bad idea by God, huh? Is it the truth? You know. You know when they catch that serial killer, that nut job on TV, and they always interview mom. She just feels mortified. I, I tried. I did my best. Now, listen to me, parents. No matter how hard you work, sometimes your kid's going to be an idiot and make a bad choice. That doesn't, it sort of reflects on you, but it was his or her bad choice. It is not your fault. Don't lay up in guilt and beat yourself up, okay? I think my dad, you can analyze him. You could say, well, he was a little rough. He, listen, today, if you're in the military now, you know you get to hold something up. You get to hold up a red circle, and the red circle means uh, I'm a little stressed, and I need a break. Anybody retired from the military recently? Am I telling the truth? My dad was 18 years old when he went to World War II. He got hit with a grenade. He was missing in action. He was a prisoner of war. He came home and had to go to work. Nobody gave him uh, any psychology or any pills. He had to do the best he could. He was kind of whacked. But even in his whack state, he hugged my mom every day. And he protected his daughters and his son. With, with what he had, man, he was the most unbelievable father in the universe for what he had and what he had to deal with. The best the best. What are you going to do when the bombs are flying over your head? R red circle. <laughs> Crazy, man. Crazy. Now, the, the very next verse, Leviticus 19.3, just the second part of it. This is still one sentence. One sentence. He says, after, after you want to show me, take care of your parents. Respect them, honor them. Then he says, and you are to keep my Shabbats. I am Adonai, your God. Okay? The word keep in the Hebrew, shamar, is mean to guard. To guard. To observe. To give heed to. To take seriously. Now, Genesis 2, 2 through 3 says this. On the seventh day, God was finished with his work, which he had made. So he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had made. God blessed the seventh day and separated it as holy. Because on that day, God rested from all his work, which he had created, so that it itself could produce. It wasn't a rest like we think. Oh, I'm exhausted. I worked all day in the yard. I need a rest. God doesn't tire. Right? We know this. It says he does not slumber or sleep. He never sleeps. He's spirit. He doesn't sleep. He doesn't need to sleep. So this was not a, a, a rest of weariness, but a rest of satisfaction. I'm just going to kick back and look at this. Wow. Look at the universe. Man, look at the human being. Wow. Wow. Do you know when you go see places like the wonders of the world, I remember going to uh, the Grand Canyon and being on the North Rim, and there was a couple of people there. And they were like, wow, this is awesome. I said, you know what? I said, you know who made this, right? They're like, well, they are some millions of years. I was like, oh, great. <laughs> I said, I'm telling you right now that the Grand Canyon is looking back at you and going, wow, a human being. Grand Canyon can't heal nobody. Grand Canyon can't pray for nobody. Grand Canyon can't share the goodness and greatness of the Lord and his kingdom with nobody. You're the best thing God's got. That's why he made everything those days before and said, look what I got for you. I built you a beautiful house. Just take care of it. He knew what he was doing. It was a, re it was a rest of satisfaction and completion. Satisfaction and completion. And you know what God did? He blessed it. He blessed it, and he separated it, and he called it holy. God set it apart. He made it special, but why? I'll give you three quick reasons, then we'll move on. One, when we observe the Shabbat, we are declaring in our observance that God is the creator and the sustainer of the universe. We are putting it right in Satan's face. You didn't make nothing. You were a created being, and when you tried to come up against God, it was like a one-second fight, man. He opened up the hatch and you were history 
and you're on a leash to this day, you don't dictate to him. You got to knock on his door just to have a meeting and you come and you bow your head before a holy God. You understand me, Satan? You declare that and you also declare that you are under his jurisdiction by being obedient, not with your mouth, with your action. This is so pleasing to the Father. He separated it. He made it holy. Why are you jerking around? Stop telling people about Constantine and the Council of Lateran Council of 364 and start observing it. Why don't you try it at least? Number two, the Lord kept it himself. We're called to be godly. Remember, we're called to do as he did. Human holiness is, is the imitation of God. And number three, it's not only that Shabbat is a much-needed rest for, for, for us who are overstimulated, distracted, and so tired. I mean, it's unbelievable. I go to the um, to convenience store, and every day they come out with a new drink, a new energy drink. And the lineup, they're causing accidents at Dunkin' Donuts and Starbucks because people are drinking coffee like it's water and taking energy pills we're so tired. Take a Shabbat rest. Not only do we need the rest, and God is the manufacturer, right? So you have to check the manufacturer's label. Work six, chill one. But we get to spend quality uninterrupted, much-needed time with our Heavenly Father. Let's take this a little further. Mark 2, 27, 28. Then he, uh, this does not say in your scriptures, I amplified it, I just want to know who the he was. Then he, Yeshua, said to them, his disciples, Shabbat was made for mankind. Shabbat was made for mankind? Is God good? Do you think he would make something for his creation that was bad? No. God is too wise to make a mistake, and he's too loving to be unkind. This is, this is your Savior talking, remember? Remember all you Jesus freaks who love Jesus? He's saying Shabbat was made for you. This is him talking, not Rabbi Greg, not some Jew from the Bronx who's trying to get a message across. It's him. Not mankind for Shabbat, like some of you have screwed up. Oh, it's 617, i got to light the candles. Oh, boy. Oh, boy, oh, boy, oh, boy, oh, boy. <laughs> Mess up a gift. Mess up a gift. So the Son of Man is even Lord over the Shabbat. He's Lord of the Shabbat. Don't worship Shabbat. Worship the Lord of the Shabbat on Shabbat. Now, a word of caution when it comes to the Shabbat. Yeshua doesn't challenge the Sabbath, but the Pharisees' interpretation of the Sabbath. Yeshua reminded the Pharisees that the Sabbath was a gift from God instituted for man's benefit, not for his bondage. Remember, when did God create man? On the sixth day. When did he create the Shabbat? On the seventh day, not the other way around. Some of you reverse that. We know that Yeshua kept the Sabbath, right? So far, we know Yeshua honored his, his mother and father. His father was gone, passed away, long gone. And his mother was there at the cross. And what does he say in the midst of the most excruciating physical pain known to man? Cicero, all the greats studied, studied torture. This is the most torturous, painful way to die. And in the midst of his pain, he's still revering his mother. John, you're my favorite. You're my best. Take care of my mother. She is now your mother. Mother, I am not going to leave you in an old age home. This is your son. He will provide for you. On his deathbed. Do we know that Yeshua kept the Sabbath? 
check the Gospels. And he went to Nazareth on the Sabbath, which was his custom. And he went to Nazareth on the Sabbath, and he went to Kepharnachum on the Sabbath, which was his custom. You love Jesus, but you're not keeping his custom? I'm so glad I started with that letter. I'm so glad. Now, of course, Yeshua kept the Sabbath. Of course. But many Orthodox Jews and many Gentile pastors say, well, yeah, he did. Because you can't refute it, right? Well, you know when somebody goes, well, he did. Right there, I'm like, give me a break. Well, he did. And then what do they got to do? Put a big butt after that. But... And what if they say really long like that? You know they're lost. But... A lot of Orthodox Jews and, and Gentile pastors believe that Yeshua did, that Jesus did, but Paul didn't. Paul changed it. Jesus did because he had to. See, Jesus had to. Because if Jesus doesn't keep the Sabbath, then he's a what? He's a lawbreaker. And what's a lawbreaker? A sinner. And then his blood's not pure, so we're not saved. But Paul's not Jesus. Paul's just like one of us. And he didn't keep it. And he was a Jew's Jew. So if Paul didn't keep it, clearly we don't have to. They uncircumcised Paul in the church. Yep. Even in the scriptures, though, even in the scriptures, there were accusations about Paul violating the Torah. Look at Acts 21, 28. Men of Israel, help, they shouted. This is the man, talking about Paul. They're after him. There were, there were a ton, there were, th listen, by Acts 21, there was tens of thousands of Messianic Jews. Not many, not many Messianic Gentiles, not many believers at all that were Gentile. Tens of thousands, it tells us at this point. And they're yelling, these are Jews who do not believe Jesus is the Messiah. They're saying, men of Israel, help! They're shouting. This is the man, this Paul, who goes everywhere, teaching everyone things against the people, against the Torah, against this place, the temple. He's saying, this Jew is nuts, and he is trying to pull Jews away from the faith. Which is what they're still saying today, by the way, about people like me. And now... Not only this, if that's not bad enough, he brought some goyim, some non-Jews, into the temple. And now it's defiled because there was a court of Gentiles. That's why when you read in Ephesians 2 that he broke down the middle wall, literally he broke down the middle wall. Now the two become one. The mitzvah, it's, it's legit. So he's referring to that place where the Gentiles were stuck. Okay? So here's the accusation. And many pastors and Orthodox Jews go, see, Paul broke, broke he didn't keep the Sabbath. He didn't. Let me just show you three quickie scriptures and we'll move on because we got some work to do. This is Paul before Governor Felix, okay, Acts 24, 14. But this I do admit to you, this is Paul speaking, quotation marks. I worship the God of our fathers in accordance with the way. The way, that's what it was called in the first century. It was called the way, Okay. Was it called the way to the Methodist church, to the Baptist church, to the Pentecostal church? It was called the way. All right? Which they call a sect. What's a sect? They still call us a sect. It's heretical. It's a cult. It's a cult. And I wish you would stop moving here because you're just giving them more ammunition to call me a cult leader. <laughs> That's all you're doing. You're helping their cause. Which they call a cult. I continue. Who's this speaking? What, what Bible are these Gentile pastors reading and somebody give these Orthodox rabbis a New Testament for God's sakes? Instead of listening to what somebody else said and somebody else said and somebody else said. Quote Scripture. Paul says, I continue to believe everything that accords with the Torah. How do you refute that? Either he's adhering to the Torah or he's a schizophrenic. And everything written in the prophets. Show you two more quickies. Paul before Governor Festus. 
25, 7, 8 of Acts. When he arrived, the Judeans, those are the ones that didn't believe in Yeshua, don't say the Jews. Some of your scriptures are bad. The Jews, that's messed up. Because you say the Jews and you include all the Jews. And yet there were tens of thousands of Jews who believed in Yeshua. It's not right. It's anti-Semitic. It's like a knucklehead who goes to a Chinese restaurant. He has a bad time and says, I don't like Chinese people. There are two billion Chinese people, moron. You met three. When he arrived, the Judeans, thank God for the complete Jewish Bible, who had come down from Jerusalem, they came down. They came down to accuse him. With Governor Festus, they said this bringing many serious charges that would cause him to be killed, to be killed, stoned. But they couldn't prove any. In reply, Shaul, that's Paul, by the way, said this, quote, I've committed no offense, not against the Torah, to which the traditional Jews hold, not against the temple, not even against the emperor of Rome. I still adhere to it. What are they reading? One more. This is the end of his life right before he's going to be beheaded. Acts 28, 17. says, after three days, Shaul called a meeting of the local Jewish leaders. He called a meeting. When they had gathered, he said to them, brothers. Isn't that beautiful? Just think about that. They consider him a heretic, and he's saying, uh-uh. Listen, Paul said something that nobody in here could ever pull off legitimately. I would give up my salvation to see one Jew get saved. I would go to hell for the rest of my life to see one Jew get saved. Brothers, although I have done nothing against either our people or the traditions of our father, I was made a prisoner in Jerusalem and handed over to Romans, to the Romans. Do I rest my case? Okay. Let's move on to that last verse in Leviticus 19, 19.4. So, so far we've got honor your parents. God's saying, you want to be holy? Honor your parents and give heed to my Shabbats. And then he throws one more in there. Just, and this is three verses, not the whole chapter. This is not exhaustive by no means. Do not turn to idols and do not cast metal gods for yourself. Again, I am, I don't know your God. Idolatry was prohibited. And in ancient times, idols were much more obvious than they are today. Why? Because they were carved images. Proudly displayed. We knew when person was an idol worshiper. When I go to India, I know if you're an idol worshiper. Why do you think God invented the mezuzah? He's like, I want you to mark your house that you belong to me. I want you to mark your house that you belong to me. Because back in the day, they marked their houses with these idols. Now today, our idols are a little bit more insidious. We don't have totem poles just in our heart. Right? Our family could be an idol. Our business can be an idol. Our hobbies can be an idol. The way we look can be an idol. But it's a little bit more insidious because it's not so obvious. But anything you put before God, make no mistake, is an idol. Our God is a jealous God. He's not envious of our happiness. He wants us to be happy. He wants us to be happy. But it's more like kind of a jealousy of a husband for the wife he loves. I mean, I'm not, I'm not a stalker. I don't check Bernadette's stuff. I don't ever go in her bag. I don't ask us, where were you today? I don't interrogate. I'm not, because I trust her for the most part, but she also knows... <laughs> she also knows if I catch her, I'll kill her, so... That's her call. He believes in monogamy, not in polygamy. He's monogamous, our God. He doesn't want you to share him. He doesn't want to share you. So in just two verses of chapter 19, two in the book of Leviticus, God says so much, right? Only he can do that. In two verses this is what God says. Hey, honor your parents, honor my Shabbats, and don't dishonor me. Boom. Now we've got to look at our New Testament, and this flows in nicely. The, the, hold off on that one second, dear. Thanks. The book of Romans, I tell you all the time, is the quintessential theological book for the new covenant believer. 
and it's just a conversation going on with an objector. With an objector. Do, do we really need Yeshua to be saved? Yes, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So we're going to read from Romans 6, but I've got to tie it in. You've got to have context. So at the end of Romans 5, this is what's going on, okay? In the end of chapter 5 of, of the book of Romans, Paul says that grace superabounded over all a man's sin, right? Superabounded, to which I say, hallelujah. Somebody should have said it along with me. You ungrateful, saved person, you. But this then raises a very important question, which brings us to this chapter, guys. Does the teaching of the gospel or salvation by grace permit or even encourage sinful living? This is what they're asking. You know the answer. Chapter 6 of Romans answers this very question. So let's look at our New Testament reading now. We just have three verses. It says, For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in relationship to righteousness. But what benefit did you derive from the things of which you are now ashamed? The end result of those things was death. However, now, freed from sin and enslaved to God, you do get the benefit. It consi- what is the benefit? It consists in being made holy, set apart for God, and its end result is eternal life. So let's break it down real quick. 620, almost there. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in relationship to righteousness. What is he talking about? He's talking about before Yeshua. Before you were saved. Some people think they were saved their whole life. That's not even possible. Paul tells the believers that when they were slaves to sin, so before Yeshua, make no mistake, you were what? A slave to sin. A slave to sin. The only freedom that we knew prior to Yeshua was freedom from righteousness. Right? I just told Bernard that this morning, I, 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 I walk in shame sometimes because I used to, on my bed, plot evil. Plot. But she said, but look at you now. You just plot good. I said, I know. I know, I know, but still. Still. Don't glory in your old life. Some people talk about it like that. You're glorifying Satan. Well, this is what I used to do. You should be ashamed. I'm ashamed. And that's not bad. By the way, there's a huge difference between shame and guilt. Did you hear me? There is a huge difference between shame and guilt. It was a desperate condition we were in. Desperate. Bound by every evil, free from every good. I'm sure somebody can relate to this, no? Huh? I mean, this is a weird place, this religious place we call Macon. If you didn't drink before you, and you didn't have sex before you got married, you walk on water. No, it just means you didn't drink, didn't have sex. In fact, the Bible didn't say that having sex is abomination, but he does say gossip is. Hello? He, calls, he, he puts gossipers in Proverbs 6 with murderers because you're murdering somebody's soul. <gasps> Rabbi, I, I didn't think, I mean, I just, I didn't drink and I didn't smoke and I didn't have sex, so I'm, I'm, I'm what? You're a sinner. That's what you are. Stop, nah, no, Rabbi, you don't understand. My grandmother was wonderful. Your grandmother was a gossiper. She was a murderer. It's only one that walked on water, sweet pea. And his name is Yeshua. Don't forget it. 621. It's okay. You don't have to come back next week. It's all right. <laughs> you made a mistake this week, but that's, that's your mistake, not mine. Yeah, you're not. We don't have memberships. I so don't think nobody's going to call you or give you a pen or a CD. We don't do that. 621. But what benefit did you derive from the things of which you are now ashamed? See? He's saying to these believers, these Gentile believers now, Rome, he's saying, you should be ashamed. What did Paul say? Did he say, I was the chief of sinners? I am. Present tense, you sure? I think your Bible's messed up. He was the chief of sinners. Uh Uh-uh. He said, I am. He'll never forget. He'll never forget, because if you don't forget, then you can glorify the Lord all the more. But what benefit did you derive from the things of which you are now ashamed? The end result of the thing was death. Paul challenges them, yes, 
Paul challenged people. He was tough. He laced in. He was like a little pansy preacher that says, I'm okay, you're okay. They're setting you up for failure. You raise a kid like that, you're setting that kid up for failure. Okay? His boss is going to treat him like mama does. Honey, it's get up, baby. Come on. It's a, I made you breakfast. Pull him out of bed. <laughs> Throw the mattress over. You think his boss is going to go, oh, baby, you could be late again tomorrow. You're fired. <laughs> Set him up for the real. People are going to think I am such a lousy dad. Talk to my kids. They'll tell you what kind of dad I am. And they will be free to tell you anything you want to know. Okay? Love isn't just giving in. Okay? When you really love somebody, you'll do whatever you can to protect them. And boundaries are love. You better believe it. So Paul challenges them and us. And us. This isn't just to the Romans. To inventory... The fruits of our unsaved life. Take an inventory of it. Fruits in those activities of which we should now be ashamed. To which the end of those things was death. Both physical and spiritual. 622. However, that's so good. I mean, if it stopped at 21, it's like, great. So now I just got to live in shame. No, however, however, come on, smile. We're getting a however, it's good. However, now, freed from sin and enslaved to God, hallelujah. You're going to have to serve somebody in this world that might as well be your heavenly father. You do get the benefit. Wow. So all I did was get cursed. Now I get benefit. What's the benefits? You know, that's, everybody's looking for benefits today, right? Nobody gives benefits anymore, right? Everybody's hiring people on, you're going to work this much because I'm not giving you any benefits. You ain't getting no benefits. Heck no. You know what your benefit is? That you get to show up for work and you get to work for me. Slave driver. God in his kingdom gives us benefits. Eternal benefits. It consists of being made holy. We're holy by association. Don't you understand? No matter what I do, and I do a ton, a ton. Rabbi, that sounds arrogant. I don't care what you think. I do a massive amount, and I could never exonerate my shame. I will never be able to do enough to pay God back. I can't pay him back. I've tried, I'm a believer, 30 years. For 25 years, I, does anybody know what I'm talking about? Then please, raise your hand, shake your head, do something. I tried, guys. Now, you know what I do? I hide under Yeshua. I hide under Yeshua. Every time I go before God, I make sure Yeshua is with me. It consists of being made holy. Wow. Set apart. And the end? There is no end. It's the beginning. Being born again changes a man completely. And I mean completely. I am a living testimony. It's been a great change. It's been a great change. <laughs> now, this man, this woman is free from sin as their master. And they become a willing, do you hear me? A willing slave to God. God, the world overworks me. You overwork me. The Lord has never overworked me. The result is a holy life now and everlasting life at the end of the journey. Of course we have eternal life now too, but this verse refers to that life in its fullness, including the glorified, resurrected body. 
So here's the bottom line today, folks. There are two masters, sin and God. There are two methods, works and grace. And there are two results, death and eternal life. So like everything else in our Bible, there are just two choices. Anybody as old as me? Anybody know let's make a deal with Monty Hall? Let me see your hands. Okay. There are no third choice. Monty Hall gave them three doors to choose from. That was the big deal. The big deal with God is you get door number one or door number two. Last two verses and we're out. Deuteronomy 30, 19, 20. At the end of this Israelite covenant that God made with the children of Israel, he says, I call on heaven and earth. There's nobody more he can call on because back in the Middle East, they would use God as a witness. He can't call on himself, so he calls on heaven and earth like they're going to attest to what he's saying. To witness against you today that I, in my kindness and goodness and wisdom and love, have presented to you life and death. I have presented to you the blessing and the curse. Therefore, God's saying, choose life. Choose life so that you will live. You and your children. You'll live loving God. Paying attention to what He says. Clinging to Him. You know there was a book written, I think it sold 3 million copies, The Purpose Driven Life. I could have wrote that book in one sentence. One sentence. This is the purpose. This is the very purpose of your life. There are so many choices today. So many, too many, way too many choices today. I don't know how you do it. I go and what salad dressing do you want? Whatever you t- pick one for me. I have to get glasses, pick a frame. You can't ask somebody to pick a frame. Yes, I can. Too many choices. It will drive you crazy. Searching the internet. Well, these have a blue stripe halfway down. What do you think of these? You're nuts. <laughs> That's what I think. That's why I just love the simplicity of God's word. Life or death, blessing or curse, but the choice is ours. To choose life, guys, is to choose God himself. Do you hear me? To choose life, to choose God is choosing life. To choose life is choosing God. To choose God, though, is to love God. And to love God is to trust him and to obey him and commit our very lives to him. Here's a saying that you can trust. Hear me if you heard nothing else. For those of you who want to get close to God, okay? I'm sure there's at least one. The more of yourself you give to God, the more of himself he will give to you. The more of yourself, and hear me, God will never disappoint you. I had a God moment in Florida where I was cleaning the floor. And all of a sudden, a revelation came to me. God spoke to me, not audibly, but he spoke to me. And he said, kid, I've been involved in every aspect of your life. Now, I've preached that, and I've taught that, that if you give your heart to God, he will. But it's kind of hard to embrace all the time, right? Especially when nothing's going right, and a lot of things didn't go right for me. Okay? So when things are, you know, when hell is breaking loose, it's not easy to go, okay, you're involved in this too, right? Am am I talking to anybody who understands what I'm saying? But in that moment, I began to weep because for some reason, I believed it. I don't know why. I believed that he was intimately involved in every, in, in, in Bernadette, in my kids, in the ministry in Florida, in bringing me to Macon, in sending me to India, in getting me to meet Bill Foster. Everything he was moving around like I was a chess piece, clueless, and this big hand came out of heaven and he was just moving me. And do you realize God can do that for anybody if you're willing to be a chess piece? So many people are looking for meaning and purpose in their lives today. Sadly enough, so many people feel so unfulfilled with their life, they are running and gunning. Running and gunning only to stand still. I can only hope and pray that we choose wisely. I can only hope and pray that we choose life. Shabbat shalom. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. 
And may the Lord lift up his very countenance upon you and give you his peace in the name of the Prince of all Peace, Yeshua. Shalom. I love you guys very much. Have a great day.